It's 8 o'clock. Good morning. This is Northern Light for Friday, November 3rd. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. A state Senate hearing on New York's legal cannabis rollout this week highlighted flaws in the system. Some Democratic senators say the Office of Cannabis Management needs to work harder to close down illegal pot shops. This is a public health issue, particularly for young people. Does it not deserve a more expedited process for addressing the illegal shops? Voters in Watertown will be choosing a new mayor on Election Day. The two candidates largely agree on the top issues, but over the last couple of years, they've disagreed on several major city projects. That's what I would be promoting as mayor, making sure that the public is well aware of how their money's being spent, making sure that they have a seat at the table when these big decisions are being made. You have to have vision. You can't just act on what's happening today. You have to think about five years, 10 years, 50 years from now. How will this impact the city? And John Warren checks trail conditions in the Adirondacks for us this first weekend in November. All of that's coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by the Depot Theater, Westport, a professional equity theater in the Adirondack, celebrating its 45th season, depotheater.org. And Adirondack Foundation and the Adirondack Birth to Three Alliance, dedicated to providing all children the best possible start in life, adirondackbt3.org. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. Voters in Watertown will choose a new mayor on Election Day. And for the first time in its history, a woman will lead the city. Watertown has a nonpartisan city council, so these candidates don't have party affiliations. They largely agree on the top issues, but over the last couple of years, they've disagreed on several major city projects. Catherine Wheeler reports. Sarah Campo Pierce and Lisa Ruggiero each want to be the next mayor of Watertown. Both say they want to change how the city's government operates. Over the last few years, we've seen a lot of negativity on council. Sometimes our meetings are a circus or, or there's been a lot of dysfunction. That's Lisa Ruggiero. She says she wants to be mayor because she sees it as an extension of the work she's already doing around the city. This is Ruggiero's sixth year on city council. She's a business owner and is the president of the Smithville Volunteer Fire Department just outside of Watertown. I already have the skill set. I already have the tools that I need to be mayor. But I think that uh, people need to realize that I will not tolerate disruption. Compo Pierce says she knows how dysfunctional the city meetings are, too. But she says she's remained professional and that temperament is what voters should be seeking out. I always said if I was in the mayor's chair... I would if things got to a point where not everybody was acting like adults and it was necessary, I would just call for a recess and have everybody vacate their seats and calm themselves and go back out and do the work that we're supposed to be doing. Compo Pierce has been on the city council for nearly five years. She started out as a reporter at a local TV station where she covered the council. Then she joined former state senator Patty Ritchie's office where she rose up the ranks to chief of staff. She says with her experience, she learned about government from all angles. It also was great for the relationship building. I worked with people at all levels of government. And those relationships that I built throughout the years, I know I could uh, tap into as mayor and use them to help move the city forward. Both Compo Pierce and Ruggiero say they want to increase transparency between City Hall and the public. Ruggiero says as mayor, she wants to hold weekly office hours for community members to come in and ask questions. Compo Pierce and Ruggiero do disagree on some recent city deals. Compo Pierce voted against last year's budget when it added more than 20 new positions. The Watertown Daily Times reported that Compo Pierce said it was about being cautious during uncertain economic times. Ruggiero supported it. Ruggiero also supported spending almost $4 million for a third city pool, while Compo Pierce said the project was costly and the city didn't need it. But Ruggiero says it's projects like that that move the city forward. 
you have to have vision. You can't just act on what's happening today. You have to think about five years, 10 years, 50 years from now. How will this impact the city? Rogero also supported the city's $3.4 million purchase of a golf club in Thompson Park. Compo Pierce did not. Compo Pierce says the way the city handled that deal didn't sit right with her. She says the public needs more clear communication, especially when it comes to spending tax dollars. That's what I would be promoting as mayor, making sure that the public is well aware of how their money's being spent, making sure that they have a seat at the table when these big decisions are being made, um, and just better communication with the public. Ruggiero and Compo Pierce agree that a top priority for the next mayor is addressing what to do when the city's hydropower plant contract with National Grid ends in 2030. The city stands to lose millions in annual revenue. Ruggiero says the city needs to start working on this now and appoint a hydro committee. I think by having a committee appointed to uh, move that forward so that we know exactly what the options are, and then we have to start working on that so that we have something in place before the contract runs out. Ruggiero says other issues she wants to tackle include updating the city's charter and addressing infrastructure problems. Compo Pierce says infrastructure is a priority for her, too. She also wants to improve the city's drinking water quality and fiscal responsibility. She says these aren't the exciting or flashy projects, but they could help the city grow. If a business is looking for a way to expand or a place to expand to and they look into Watertown, New York and see that we don't have quality drinking water or infrastructure is crumbling and we can't even provide water to people, they're not going to want to locate here. In addition to mayor, two Watertown City Council seats are up for grabs. And if Ruggiero wins, the council will have to appoint a new member to replace her. Election day is November 7th. Catherine Wheeler, North Country Public Radio. A state Senate hearing on New York's legal cannabis rollout this week highlighted flaws in the system. And some Democratic senators say the Office of Cannabis Management needs to work harder to close down illegal pot shops. Karen DeWitt reports. The law to allow the sale of adult recreational marijuana was approved two years ago. Since then, bureaucratic roadblocks and court injunctions have slowed the program. As a result, only around two dozen legal retail shops have opened out of the more than 160 that were supposed to be in business by now. At the same time, possession and sales of marijuana has been decriminalized. As a result, an estimated 3,000 illegal pot shops are in business all across the state. At a hearing this week, state senators grilled Office of Cannabis Management's executive director, Chris Alexander, on steps his agency is taking to close the stores. Senator Brad Hoylman Siegel said dozens of illegal stores are operating in his Manhattan district. It includes Hell's Kitchen and parts of Greenwich Village. A worker at Smoke City on 710 Ninth Avenue was shot in the leg during an attempted robbery and Uh, January. There was a shooting in front of a store called Forbidden Cannabis in Hell's Kitchen. An unlicensed shop at 423 Ninth Avenue was recently held up at gunpoint. There was a fire at an unlicensed smoke shop at 346 West 52nd. Hell's Kitchen Clouds, it's called. By the way, these shops should be shut down just for their bad puns. Hoylman Siegel says high school students are known to frequent some of the illegal shops, which he says market their products to children. He asked Alexander what his office plans to do about it. This is a public health issue, particularly for young people. Does it not deserve a more expedited process for addressing the illegal shops? Uh, Alexander answered. I absolutely agree, Senator. This absolutely is a significant threat to public health. Uh, and for the sales to minors, I mean, you know, that remains a felony offense. Uh, that is something that remains on the books. Um, I know, uh, you know, law enforcement, particularly in the city, have, under, have done underage buys. Uh, and many of these shops. We want them as close as bad as you do. Hoylman Siegel, along with other Democratic senators who questioned the OCM staff, backed the original law to legalize cannabis. Senator Liz Krueger, who represents parts of Manhattan's east side, asked Alexander if the fines imposed for illegal operations at up to $20,000 a day are too low. If you close an illegal store and you take the product, but the fines aren't big enough to actually discourage people from just opening up again. And we did change the law to make the fines much bigger. 
then I don't believe it works at all. That you'll spend time and resources closing stores and they'll say, oh, okay, they'll take the product and two days later I'll reopen. Alexander told her that he agrees the fines are too small given the estimated profits that the illegal shops reap. Even at the $20,000 a day limit for some of these folks who are owning multiple operations across the city or across the state, it is still, you know, a cost of doing business. The legislature in June enacted new enforcement powers to close down the illegal stores. Senator Andrew Gennard is questioned why, though, after OCM initiated over 300 actions on the shops, just 16 have been closed for good so far. That seems like a startlingly low number, given the fact that we all recognize there are thousands of, of these illegal shops around the state. The hearing comes as the online news publication The City reports that OCM has put its hearing process to levy fines against illegal pot shops on hold, saying they don't have enough staff. Alexander told senators that his office plans to restart the hearings, but he says he doesn't know the exact date. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt. You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's 11 minutes past 8. Good morning, I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Coming up, a Potsdam woman and her paddling team have become the first people ever to kayak the Arctic Ocean's Northwest Passage in a single season. We'll hear a conversation with her coming up in just a few minutes right here on Northern Light. Gretchen Kohler on the fiddle, Daniel Kelly on the piano. The Northern Light is supported by CECOM Credit Union, serving the financial needs of people throughout northern New York and Vermont in person, online at CECOM.org and on your smartphone. And by St. Lawrence Health, offering my care, a way for patients to access health information and stay connected to their care team. Registration is available at stlawrencehealthsystem.org. The CEO of a major Adirondack tourism organization has announced that he plans to retire in the spring. Jim McKenna has led the Regional Office of Sustainable Tourism, or Roost, for four decades. He also serves as a co-chair of the North Country Regional Economic Development Council. McKenna played a major role in building Roost into its current role as the official marketing organization for Lake Placid, Saranac Lake, Tupper Lake, and Essex and Hamilton counties. In a press release, McKenna said his philosophy has been to prioritize the needs of local communities first and not to disrupt their heritage. Governor Kathy Hoko called McKenna, quote, the face and voice of Adirondack tourism. He was instrumental in bringing the 2023 Winter World University Games to the North Country. Roost's board of directors will conduct a national search to fill McKenna's position after he retires in April. A new federal report says the number of children living in food insecure households jumped by 44% last year. Lucy Grindon has more. Last week, the U.S. Department of Agriculture released its annual report on household food security. What was most surprising that came out of this USDA report was the skyrocketing increase of child hunger. Rachel Sabella is the New York State Director of No Kid Hungry, a nonprofit advocacy group. She says child food insecurity in New York follows national trends. Last year, it was one in eight children that could face food insecurity. This year, we're looking at nearly one in five kids. Sabella says food insecurity looks different for different families. Some parents may skip meals so their kids can eat. Some may buy cheaper options, which means fewer fresh, healthy foods like fruits, vegetables and meat. And some may have to give their kids portions that are too small to make the food they can afford last longer. 
we did a survey in the spring and we had one mother who said that she was hiding food in the closet because she was afraid her children were going to eat it before the end of the month. And she needed to make sure um, that they still had access to that food. Sabella says the end of pandemic era public benefits is largely responsible for the increase in food insecurity and that kids need a local, state and federal government to do more. We know the solution is simple. We've seen so many of these solutions work, whether it was the child tax credit, expanded SNAP benefits, increased access to summer meals. But we need to make sure that government is coming together to reinstate expand and protect these programs because that's how we're going to help families put food on the table. New York's child poverty rate is 18.5 percent, but it's even higher in some parts of the North Country. Lewis County, Herkimer County, Franklin County and St. Lawrence County all have child poverty rates above the state average. Lucy Grindon, North Country Public Radio. Although this is typically a quieter time of year for search and rescue incidents, forest rangers responded to several incidents in the North Country and Adirondacks last week. Last Wednesday, a hiker got lost on the Rock River Trail in Indian Lake. She was found by a ranger and was helped back to her car at the trailhead. A few days later, a pair of hikers drove down an unmaintained road and got their car stuck near Crane Pond. A ranger helped the pair find a tow truck operator and gave them a ride to Scroon Lake after their vehicle wouldn't start. And lastly, on Saturday, a 71-year-old hunter was reported overdue. Four forest rangers responded to Pierce Field, where they found the lost hunter and walked him back to the road. The Department of Transportation will provide more than $5 million to finish the terminal expansion project at the Port of Ogdensburg. According to Senator Chuck Schumer's office, the project will increase the port's capacity. Its goal is to make the port able to accommodate two or more ships at at a time instead of just one. The first phase will be to dredge and deepen the harbor, which is currently too shallow for some large ships. The second phase will expand the terminal's dock and storage facilities. Ogdensburg Port is the only port on the U.S. side of the St. Lawrence River. It moves about $150 million of goods each year. And public health officials say parents should not feed their kids wanna banana apple cinnamon fruit puree pouches because they may contain elevated levels of lead. The St. Lawrence County Public Health Department issued a warning this week from the FDA. Parents and caregivers of toddlers and young children who may have consumed wanna banana fruit pouches should contact their kids' health care providers about getting blood testing done. Short-term symptoms of lead exposure can include headache, abdominal pain, and vomiting. You can get more news from NCPR throughout the day at our website, ncpr.org, or follow the station on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. You're listening to Northern Lights here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Coming up in just a minute, a St. Lawrence County woman and three fellow paddlers became the first people ever to kayak the Arctic Ocean's Northwest Passage in a single season. We'll have a conversation with Eileen Visser coming up in just a few minutes. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note coming up at 842. But first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. Partly cloudy today, highs in the low 50s this afternoon, winds out of the south-southwest, 10 to 15 miles per hour. The chance of some scattered showers starting tonight and uh, winds gusting up to 30 miles per hour overnight tonight, lows in the 40s. Tomorrow, about a 50% chance of scattered showers, highs near 50 on Saturday, 40s, low 50s on Sunday, and a high in the mid-50s on Monday. Right now in Canton, clouds, 43 degrees. Here's John Warren with a check of outdoor conditions for the weekend. On Saturday, sunrise will be at about 737 and sunset at about 542. Daylight savings time ends on Sunday. It's looking to be a cloudy weekend weather-wise with the possibility of a few showers. Keep an eye on the forecast and be prepared for cold temperatures and rain. 
The forecast for the highest summits is calling for temperatures mostly around freezing, with wind chills mostly in the teens, except today when they will be in the single digits and winds 35 to 45 miles per hour. There is a chance for some overnight snow that will leave a little accumulation on summits tomorrow morning. Otherwise, trails will be wet and muddy. Be prepared for winter conditions and carry traction devices for any icy areas you may encounter at higher elevations. Parking reservations are no longer required for the AMR Hiker parking lot on Route 73. Waters are at about normal seasonal low levels around the region. Water temperatures are mostly in the 40s, although some higher elevation waters have fallen into the 30s, and there could be a little overnight skim ice. Those are the outdoor conditions in the Adirondacks this weekend. For North Country Public Radio, this is John Warren from the New York Almanac, online at newyorkalmanac.com. You're listening to Northern Light right here on North Country Public Radio. It's about 20 after 8. Good morning. I'm Monica Sandreski here with Todd Moe. And last month, a St. Lawrence County woman and three fellow paddlers became the first people to ever kayak the Arctic Ocean's Northwest Passage in a single season. Eileen Visser and her team paddled 1,800 miles over 104 days to make history. They battled icebergs, biting wind, and the arrival of winter. David Summerstein spoke with Visser in her biology office at St. Lawrence University just after she arrived back home. Eileen Visser unrolls a map of her journey on her office floor. Okay, let's roll it out. A yellow dotted line charts their course, winding through the straits and islands of the fabled Northwest Passage. From east to west, it's like paddling from Chicago to Seattle except with icebergs and bitter cold, even in summer. 104 days, I think it was total, but Uh that's including the wind off days. So we were stuck in our tent, you know, wishing we could paddle. Because what was happening? If the wind either was too intense to paddle or if it was paddleable out there, but we couldn't launch because of crashing breakers, Uh then we're stuck in the tent waiting for conditions. This is a monster paddler. She has the fastest woman record in the Adirondacks 90-miler race. She was the fastest woman in the 444-mile Yukon River Quest in Alaska in 2018. But this was another order of magnitude hard. She heard about these three guys calling themselves the Arctic Cowboys. Sort of kayak dating, but I saw, oh, they're filling a team. So I thought, I'll throw my hat in the ring. What do I have to lose? But they'll never pick me. They picked her. Their team of four, two per tandem kayak, started on July 1st. But two weeks straight of ice buildup delayed their start. In hindsight, we called them our whale watching tours. But at the time, it's just like, you know, this devastating, like, oh, here we are again. There's Button Point again in this tiny little hunter trapper cabin that we were holed up in. You know, it's like, there's Button Point again. It was good in hindsight. Now that we've done it, we got to know each other as a team. We made some major, we switched out who was in which boat. We made changes then about... Um, repacking weight and we purged a lot of the gear and so we made the expedition skinnier and better because of those trial days what does it look like when you're out there well i that's an unanswerable it's different every day it's um you know the water was i would say maybe there was half of a day of monotony in 1800 miles some of the topography like by the royal geographic islands it's a foot of elevation, flat, gravelly, muddy, um, you know, and by Bylot Island and Prince Region Inlet, you know, we're seeing spectacular. We saw glaciers. Mm-hmm. I did think towards the beginning, but maybe throughout, this is like rewinding the Adirondacks, 9,000 years. Just the plant life is lichen and a tiny bit of moss. And I watched like the inner title get more biodiverse as we moved west because we were also moving somewhat south and so it's like oh we're we're seeing some clams now mm-hmm. oh now mussels here's some sea urchins wow i see some crab you know just that kind of change so you're seeing like almost the unfolding of the retreat of the glaciers of the ice age from the adirondacks you're saying 
I mean, that's what I was imagining, although not that's being so a geologist, cool. I don't want to misquote too badly. <laughs> but that's how it felt. <laughs> yeah, that's how it yeah. felt. And um, also at the beginning of the trip, we were right there by the flow edge. So we had amazing marine biodiversity, narwhals, bowhead we saw, humpback, right whales, um, tons of polar bears, three walruses, lots of seals. You're watching all this stuff, and when you see the narwhals come to you, of course you pause, but like the overall go- goal, get the miles done, you know. And paddle, paddle, paddle. Um, what are you thinking and saying? Are you talking? Um, that's a good question. I mean, different days. Some days we're pretty quiet and thinking and watching. And, you know, of course, when we paddled one night and we had the most spectacular it was my daughter Heidi's birthday Mm. but there was just a spectacular light show with aurora um, comets shooting stars bioluminescence you know you put your paddle in the water and everything just lights up with Mm. um, fluorescent green sparkles and yeah just you know so times like that you don't talk at all you know there were days when You know, my paddling partner, Mark, would just wished I would stop talking about my dogs back at home. (laughs) Is this something you could have done pre-climate change? Like, did climate change make this easier and that there was less ice in this channel? Yeah, exactly. We shouldn't have been able to do this. The only reason that there was any chance of hoping to try was sadly because of climate change. It shouldn't be open, and it shouldn't be open for long enough for anyone to do this. So that was on my mind a lot, that it's a gift to be there and be able to experience, but also this is because of the damage we've done to the climate. The Arctic Cowboys' longest open water crossing was Prince Regent Inlet. They paddled 55 miles. They were a mile from shore. They could see it. But a floating maze of icebergs was in the way. Of course, we've paddled 55 miles. We certainly can't turn around and go back. So we're looking for leads and cracks through the ice and trying to squiggle through. And you go one way and still can't get to shore. So you retrace your steps. And maybe the labyrinth is closed a little behind you. So you look for another. Then at one point, the ice just started moving. Partly the wind, partly the tide, partly you know, mystery. But two icebergs moved together and by luck, the bow of our kayak like started popping up on the ice. So my partner, Mark, you know, it's like, get out, get out. He leaps up there, pulls the boat up a little. I hop out. We pull the boat on the iceberg and, you know, same thing happened moments later to the other boat. And now we have our two kayaks on ice and we're surrounded by ice that's moving and, you know, we need to get to shore. We looked at our GPS at that point, and we're moving three miles an hour. <laughs> like, this is not good. But, you know, then you climb up on a high point, and you see, oh, it looks kind of open over there, and maybe we can, um, you know, tiddly wink our way over. So we started dragging the kayaks from iceberg to iceberg. Mm-hmm. If it was a big enough iceberg that it could hold two kayaks, but we couldn't jump, then we would put the wait till it was moving less, make the kayak into a bridge, climb over the kayak to the other one, haul it. And we managed to get ourselves to open water, and then it's like, go, 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 jump on the boat. Why do you do this? (laughs) It must be hard on your body and hard on your mind. It's so satisfying and fun, and it called to me. What I've seen and where I've been, and, well, the immersion in nature, you know, it's real, and it I feel like humans are built for that and uh, and that awareness that you're small is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's easy to forget in the day-to-day thing that, you know, you're late for work or, you know, all of the complication. Well, there it's just like the doing and being come together. Mm -hmm. So it was a privilege. I I feel, yeah, there was a tad bit of misery involved, of course. (laughs) still trying to get the sensation back in my fingertips and but so worth it and hopefully the perspective of what's really valuable and hopefully that'll stick eileen visser of potsdam 
is a biology specialist at St. Lawrence University and now the only woman in the world to traverse the Northwest Passage in one season using human power. David Summerstein, North Country Public Radio, Canton. And you can see amazing photos and a video from Vissa's trip on our website, ncpr.org. That's it for Northern Light on this Friday, November 3rd. Morning Edition continues in just a minute. Then join us at lunchtime today for a conversation remembering Matthew Perry, best known for his iconic role as Chandler Bing on Friends. He died last weekend, and we'll have a remembrance coming up at lunchtime. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. Be well. Be well.